because I am, uh, my title notwithstanding, still much more journalist than academic, I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about the context that makes our discussions today and tomorrow around local news um, such an emergency. If every last newspaper folded, it would be sad, even a tragedy in a kind of sentimental way. But as long as communities everywhere still had alternative sources of reliable local relevant information, it would not be a threat. But since we are dealing with this disruption of the entire ecology of information in communities all over the country, I think we have to um, think about the larger problem and how the conversations that we're having around equity and inequality and anti-racism and this health and survival of democracy itself are all inextricably tied to the conversations that we are having about local news and the health of the information environment that we're living in. Uh, you all are familiar with the, the notion of uh, critical information needs, which is everything from what's the emergency or what roads are closed or what are the flu rates in our community, what are the quality of our schools, uh, where can I go look for a job or look for job training, uh, environmental issues, civic information. These are the kinds of information that um, in their absence, this is, a, this is a market failure. And Duke did this remarkable study of 100,000 um, news stories from mid-sized cities and found that 60 to 80% of those stories had to do with these subjects, with these critical information needs, which is to say that the, the most important information is often starting at the ground level. It is starting in our local newsrooms, which are then feeding information upwards to regional and national newsrooms. And so when the local newsrooms disappear, you have a disappearance, you have a hollowing out that goes upwards. So in a way, it is not only our smaller newsrooms that have been hollowed, hollowed out. This is my portrait of the apocalypse. Um, this one slide, better than anything, captures what I think of as the glory days of media, which I got to grow up in at Paradise Publishing. And then the fall off a cliff. And so in some ways, I think our understanding of how journalism is supposed to work is a reflection of a, an atypical period when it was just so relentlessly profitable and easy to make money and therefore to build newsrooms and to provide the kind of public accountability journalism that is so essential to the functioning of healthy communities tying our fortunes to algorithmic distribution platforms turned out to be a really bad bet. It turned out to create all kinds of perverse incentives that you know for newsrooms to sensationalize news, to feed tribal biases, to appeal to uh, their audiences, sometimes worst instincts and appetite for outrage. Division, it turns out, um, is a very profitable division of a lot of media companies. It's uh, by the time the triopoly of Google and Facebook and Amazon now takes more than half of all advertising. Just last year, Amazon alone, Amazon alone made more money in advertising than every newspaper on the planet put together. So what does that mean? Well, for one thing, it is not as though um, what is left is evenly divided amongst the surviving newsrooms. You see how, thick, how quickly revenue uh, and subscriptions falls off as you get to the smaller newsrooms. So the idea that subscribers are gonna save the day, that if you just put up a paywall and we move away from advertising and let our audiences take over the support, well, that's not necessarily going to work either unless you were the New York Times. And then if you look at what this means for employment, this is how much newsroom employment has fallen. And you see that it has fallen most dramatically 
in newspapers. And because newspapers are the journalists who feed every other news organization, because they are the frontline troops, the quality of all of our information is undermined when we have fewer and fewer people who are going out to hunt and gather. I don't think democracy can survive without journalism, and I don't think journalism can be done without journalists, no matter what the robots say. Uh, Penny Abernathy's maps, I know, are etched on all of your minds. This is, shows the number of counties that are now, half of our counties, are now down to a single paper. In most cases, that's a weekly. 70 million people live in counties that have no newspaper at all. And what I would emphasize about that is that that is happening particularly in regions that are disproportionately politically powerful. So if you think about the architecture of our government, if you think about the disproportionate power of rural communities in the Senate or in the Electoral College, and then it is often those same communities that are not being served by reliable, nonpartisan local news. That is it any wonder that, for instance, uh, COVID denialism and anti-vax sentiment was strongest in regions where local news was weakest. The costs we know of disappearing news, just to give you one example, besides driving up the cost of government and the likelihood in the absence of local accountability journalism of public malfeasance, there's a decline in people voting and running for office. These are the downstream impacts on the health of democracy. In 1992, just as one example, 37% of states elected a, someone from a different party to the Senate versus who that state voted for for president. More than a third of states. By 2016, not one, not one. It is harder to track disease spread. Into the vacuum comes the rise of mis disinformation. The trust in media and in institutions generally tends to decline. And the polarization that comes from a loss of cohesion, our local news organizations are in many cases not just where you go to read about your school or what roads are closed or what you know, the local zoning board is debating. It is where you come together to celebrate the football team's championship or share when the parades are going to start or what book drive is happening and a million different little pieces of immunology that make the health of local communities stronger. And when you take them away, what comes in their absence is particularly hazardous to our health. One thing that comes is when people are not encountering the other people in their community and when their information is not coming from within their community, they're more and more likely to get it from national sources, which we know tend to be much more negative, much more politically polarizing. The complexity of individuals and the challenges that communities face gets lost. And why would local elected officials feel a need to be particularly accountable to their voters if their voters know almost nothing about them than whether they suit up for Team Red or Team Blue? So this really remarkable um, polling that uh, Pew has done captures how somehow over this generation, partisan politics has become the church that people belong to. It has become the core of people's identities. And so it's hard to read that, um, that map on the right, but what that is showing is that from the 1994 on, if you ask people how they feel about how we should address poverty alleviation, or um, national security issues, or the environment, or immigration. The disagreement between people of high income and lower income, uh, college educated, non-college, black and white, men and women, young and old, was always fairly steady. They might disagree between 10 points, 12 points. And then starting around 2014, 
the disagreement of whether you identified as a Democrat or a Republican went through the roof. And so now, people are much, much more likely to have their sort of core identity defined by their partisan loyalty. It's not party loyalty, because we know the parties have never been weaker, and it's not ideological, because we know that the parties can be pretty ideologically fluid. It is, a, it is much more personal, this mode of asymmetry of believing that your side is the good side and the other side is the bad side, and this is incredibly dangerous to the ability of society to solve its problems. As a result of that, this is the work that More in Common has done. We view our political opponents through this kind of like cartoon lens. There's a scholar, Doug Allers, who wrote a paper called The Parties in Our Heads that found that more than a third of Democrats think that most Republicans earn at least $250,000 a year, when in fact it's 2%. And that most Republicans think that a third of Democrats are gay. In fact, it's four to five percent. We have these ideas, and in this case, these negative attitudes that people across the divide are brainwashed, or they can't be trusted, or they're unpatriotic, or they are racist, which partly reflects the fact that our communities, as they are dividing, as people are getting more of their information from Facebook than they are from a local source of information that they actually know and identify with, it makes it much easier for the distortions and these cartoon versions to take hold. And that brings us to a point where we are in this incredibly dangerous moment where we're not just arguing over national priorities. We're not just arguing over marginal tax rates or what's the best way to fund health care and should that be something that's largely the responsibility of government or of private industry. Those aren't the arguments. The arguments are not over policies and priorities. The arguments, we can't even agree on basic facts. 73% of people say we cannot even agree on basic facts. Only 26% think that we can. The missing 1%, I assume, can't agree on whether we agree. <laughs> so all of this happened, obviously, in the context of this drop, it's not just the press that has suffered through this period. Uh, fascinatingly, other than the military, which was able post-Vietnam to regain a measure of public trust, across the board, we are seeing other institutions being battered by uh, the collapse in faith in what institutions are supposed to be doing. But look at local news. Look at local news. And I think this is where we really have to be mindful of the opportunity that local newsrooms have to restore the fabric of our communities. They are uniquely positioned to serve a really valuable public role. And even you know, local news has a smaller partisan gap, even to the extent that Republican faith in media has plummeted in the last five years for reasons you all know. That is less true about local news organizations than it is about national news organizations. So into that hole comes the huge polluting streams of mis and disinformation, where no, you don't need to have a vaccine to have a microchip delivered, a nasal swab can insert that microchip. Um, and we have the vacuum filled by these. Hmm, they all look a lot alike. These are all um, news organizations that the Tao Center has identified as the pink slime sites. These are now in all 50 states. They come from left and right. They are meant to look like a local news organization, and they are basically, in most cases, dark money funded partisan news sites. When local news dies, it's not like no one has information. It just means that if they aren't getting good information, they are going to be exposed to all kinds of bad information, which is as bad for the health of our communities as bad water and bad air are to the health of our bodies. And Americans think that this 
that this collective of declining trust and increasing division and, and the dismemberment of our communities and the pollution of our ecology um, is actually hurting the ability of us to solve all kinds of problems, all kinds of problems that it gets in the way. So what I would argue with you as we go forward uh, today and as we think about this is, is to think in an interdisciplinary way. This is all one story. The collapsing business model underlies the fact that in an attention economy, there are tremendous incentives to divide people and to profit off of division and outrage. Into the vacuum comes a rise of, of often very profitable disinformation and a collapse of trust, and obviously the pandemic accelerated all of those. The way we think about this um, at Shorenstein is that there is not going to be any one magic solution that is going to solve this problem, which is why in addition to political scientists and media scholars, I've pulled in computer scientists and psychologists and sociologists and decision scientists to help us understand why do people believe conspiracy theories and seek them out? What are the possible technological tools that can help us um, address these? What do we need to know and share about misinformation and how do we get this information into the hands, not just of people who study misinformation, but into the hands of, of civil society and office holders who might help us figure out how to combat it. Journalist resources design, how do we get the important research that's going on in, in all sorts of think tanks and universities into the hands of people who need it? How do we bridge the research that is essential at a time when people are too busy to read it? Um, how do we use technology and build technological tools that will advance justice and equity? How do we harden newsrooms against being manipulated? And how do we immunize people against being sucked into these incredibly dangerous ways of believing? And then how do we understand the entire local news landscape? And this is where I'm so grateful to have our next guests who will give us three different ideas. And, and again, it speaks to the fact that there is not going to be a one-size-fits-all answer to this. And that, frankly, if all of you invested resources in the same solution, then way too many parts of the problem would go unaddressed. And so it is vitally important that we all, all can come together and compare notes and share best practices and talk about what we're doing, but also make room for different angles, different avenues, different approaches. And so I would ask my friends to come join me to continue this conversation. <laughs>